It's my great honor to be here at the Heritage Foundation, which is directly connected to my hero, Ronald Reagan. I first met Governor Reagan in the mid-1960s in my parents' living room. That evening had a profound impact on me. I was inspired by his vision of America and his optimism. When Governor Reagan became president in 1980, I worked in his administration in the Defense Department. And it was Ronald Reagan who set off a chain of events that changed my life completely. Let me explain. In 1986, President Reagan appointed me as the U.S. Ambassador to Austria. That was at the same time of the Kurt Waldheim controversy. Waldheim was Secretary General of the UN, and he, and he just left the United, United Nations in disgrace for lying about his Nazi past. But instead of going away quietly, Kurt Waldheim went home and ran for president, telling Austrians he didn't do anything they didn't do, which was, of course, true. And they elected him. As ambassador, I made a decision not to attend the inauguration because of his Nazi past. From that moment on, I was no longer the American ambassador. I was referred to, in certain quarters, as the Jewish American ambassador. It was the first time in my life I came up against real anti-Semitism. And it changed me from the world's most assimilated Jew to someone who has devoted his life protecting the Jewish people. Just before I say anything more, I'd like to say that I thank Kurt Waldheim for making me into a true Jew. <laughs> the topic of this talk was said long ago, the future of the U.S.-Israel alliance at 75. Over the last two weeks, that alliance has never been more important, but it's also shined a spotlight on a growing threat right here in the United States and all around the world, a threat that no one can no longer ignore. That's what I intend to talk about today. But first, I want to make one thing crystal clear at the start. On October 7th, Hamas terrorists broke through the fence separating Gaza from Israel with two aims, and two aims only, to kill as many Jews as they could and to take hostages back to Gaza. They raped, tortured, burned alive, and decapitated Jewish babies. They decapitated babies. You've heard that October 7th was, was saw the greatest loss of Jewish life on any day since the Holocaust. But there's one difference, and one huge difference. The Nazis tried to hide their crimes from the world. Hamas videotaped and even live-streamed their atrocities over a background of cheers. They didn't hide the hatred of Jews. They were proud of it. These awful images we see right here in full color, so you have expected the entire world to condemn it. Instead, on streets, not just in the Middle East, but in London, New York, Los Angeles, almost everywhere, and shockingly, on almost every college campus, we watched massive demonstrations, not in sympathy for the 1,500 Israeli men, women, and children who were butchered. Instead, young people are now waving Hamas flags and supporting Hamas. They denounce Israel for being a colonial oppressor, and they side with these barbaric terrorists. When 34 student groups at Harvard 
say we hold the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all the unfolding violence. Something has gone very wrong in our education system. Not long ago, the hatred of Israel in academia was confined to a few far-left socialist professors, or these from the Middle East. But this upside-down logic now is spread everywhere, and almost every college president, administrator, is afraid to stand up and condemn it. How did this happen? How did we get there? Or what can we do to turn this around? The radical change that brought us here was slow and steady. Few people noticed it. That it was even happening. It began in the 1960s, when a generation of anti-war professors began teaching in college classes around the country. They were eventually head departments and cut off any differing points of view in the PhD pipeline. They began to fill colleges with, with people who shared their visions and opinions. If you were working on a PhD in history and held conservative views or just opinions that differed from the crowd, there was no job for you. Then, these radical ideas spread down to secondary schools. A political science professor at Spelman College, a self-described socialist anarchist named Howard Zinn, wrote a book called A People's History of the United States, in which he told us it was America, from Columbus to robber barons to Vietnam, that brought evil on the world. The book was not serious scholarship, but it was picked up by high school teachers who were taught by those radical professors. The reasoning came down to this. All opinions are equally valid. Well, all opinions are not equally valid. Some opinions are dead wrong. So now, the next generation was learning this Marxist history in high school. The book sold over 2 million copies, and that's a very negative impact on this generation. Remember the name Bill Ayers? He was a co-founder of, of the Weather Underground that bombed public buildings in the 1960s. He should have gone to prison for life, but the FBI botched his case. Instead, he went back, Ayers went back to school, got a PhD, and became a professor of education. He had a huge impact on the books that elementary students have read over the past four decades, painting the USA as a racist and evil country. There are many other with less famous names in schools and campuses around the country. They brought us to this present day are wonderful colleges that were the envy of the world and trained generations of America who built our bridges, conquered disease, and created businesses that employed millions of people, have now produced students who cheer for terrorists, terrorists who slaughter women and children, and see America as evil. Over the last 50 years, colleges have taken out the core curriculum of Western civilization that all of us learned. Instead, we now have classes in DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, in every school. Tabaya Lee, an African-American and former DEI administrator, lost her job when she questioned the severe anti-Semitism at the center of DEI. Ms. Lee writes that DEI at its core, believe the world is divided in two groups, the oppressors and the oppressed. Jews, DEI claims, are the oppressors, and Israel is branded as a colonial state. That means Israelis who built a country out of nothing, who created the only democracy in the Middle East, who defended 
their homeland in countless wars and who fight for their lives at this very moment are now the oppressors. And don't think it's only the Jews that are the oppressors. Everyone here in this room probably falls into this category. In too many colleges, Israel is evil. The United States is evil. But the true evil of Hamas is the victim. Up is down, east is west. I should point out, there are many positive DEI programs in our corporations, especially at SD Lauder. But it's not just colleges where the problems lie, because they are training ground for the rest of society. Our great newspapers have always been an essential part of our democracy, keeping citizens informed. But today, they have, in too many places, their political beliefs, sometimes ahead of facts. This was evident last week when a hospital in Gaza was hit by a rocket. If you read the New York Times, the first banner headline was that they put up Israel strike kills hundreds in hospital, Palestinians say. That was changed to at least 500 killed in strike on Gaza, hospital, Palestinians say, which was then changed to at least 500 killed in Gaza hospital, Palestinians say. Those headlines sparked riots, sparked riots around the world. We now know the truth. The hospital was not hit by Israel. It was hit by Hamas. It wasn't even a hospital that was hit. It was a parking lot. And it wasn't 500. It was probably less than 50. But what, most of the world won't know this because of that headline. Mark Twain's famous quote was, I quote, and it's never been more true than before, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the, sh while the truth is putting on its shoes. And Mark Twain wrote that over 100 years ago, before the internet. This very important paper must realize that when headlines are not correct, it can cause the death of Jewish people, especially children through the Jewish diaspora. Because of the last week's headline, synagogues were burned in three countries, remnants of Crystal Nacht in 1938, and members of Congress, Talib and Omar, still continue to foment riots based on this lie. This is no different than the old blood libel that claimed Jews killed children to use their blood for Passover matzah. Those lives sparked programs which killed Jews by the thousands and burned down synagogues. And apparently, civilization has not advanced one iota since the Middle Ages. We see this throughout the media today at NPR, CNN, AP, and Reuters. But the worst is the BBC. They can't even call Hamas terrorists. Terrorists. They use the more benign term, militants. How can you not call these monsters terrorists? These are the same lies that cause Harvard students to demonstrate for Hamas. It's why voters elect representatives who I believe truly hate our country. And it's why we are in big trouble. Here is something all of you must remember. Throughout history, whatever begins with the Jews never ends with the Jews. We are the canaries in the mine shaft. Remember, Hitler went after the Jews first. But when it was all over, more than 60 million human beings were dead and two continents destroyed. Yes. We are the canaries in the mine shaft. And look around you. These canaries are dying. Take notice. The fact is, we are living through another McCarthyism. This one from the radical left. And it will aggressively attack you if you dare to question it. The new left-wing McCarthyism, or wokeism, has advanced 
dishonest views on gender, politics, race, history, and especially the core values that made the United States the beacon for the world. We must not let this woke McCarthyism destroy us. The hard-earned liberties that it took generations of Americans to achieve, liberties that drew millions to leave their homes and families to come to these shores, liberties that drew grandparents from Hungary, liberty that drew Liberate that drew all of you and all of our ancestors here as well. America and freedom of expression are all too necessary to let them just disappear in this dangerous wave of radicalism. I will not let this promise for all mankind be destroyed. And this is how I am fighting back. First, through the World Jewish Congress that defends hundreds of Jewish communities all over the world. I have traveled to 40 countries. I've been with prime ministers and presidents. I make them aware that we are watching everything going on in their countries for one simple reason, so that Jewish citizens can practice their faith in dignity and safety. I also created a foundation that has opened 30 Jewish schools throughout Central and Eastern Europe, where Jewish communities were almost destroyed. These, school, these schools have restarted vibrant new centers of Jewish life and fighting the dangerous intolerance right here at home on all Americans who care about our values, our freedom, and our children's future. We must be doing this for our children and grandchildren. My family is deeply involved in the University of Pennsylvania. Since my brother and I graduated 50 years ago, we created the Joseph Lauder Institute of Wharton that offers advanced degrees in international business. We have given millions of dollars to Penn over the years because we believed in Penn and everything it stood for. Last month, several of Penn's departments held a conference called Palestine Rights Literature Festival. It claimed to focus on Palestinian writers. Instead, it was the biggest anti-Semitic and anti-Israeli pep rally ever held at Penn. One of the main speakers was Roger Waters of the rock group Pink Floyd, the same Roger Waters who used a large inflatable pig that floats above his concerts, a pig with a Jewish star on it. When I pointed out to Penn's president that this conference would tarnish Penn's reputation, she refused to cancel it, citing freedom of speech. Remember the reason that all opinions are equally valid. I have to wonder if a Penn would allow a conference that denounced Asians or Native Americans or blacks. They should not, but why is it okay to say these things about Jews. Why is that acceptable? Remember, it's because we are the oppressors. It turned out to be the worst possible timing for Penn. The conference went on as scheduled, and it was bad as we feared. And then, just two weeks later, 1,500 Jews were slaughtered because they were Jews. Here is the part of a longer letter I wrote to Penn's president this past week. I quote, I have spent the past 40 years of my life fighting anti-Semitism all over the world, and never, in my wildest imagination, thought I would have to fight it at my university, my alma mater, and my family's alma mater. I have been joined by other donors who have stopped their own gifts to Penn, including John Huntsman, who is not Jewish. He's just an honorable man. Every single university, every newspaper, every cable channel has to understand there are consequences for their actions. We can no longer be silent. None of us can sit back. Albert Einstein said it very well. 
the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. Let me repeat that. I think it's so important. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. This is the time we all have to stand up and say, this insanity is over. We all have to stand up with Israel because it's democracy on the front lines of a deadly war and terror, a war they did not, did not go away after 9-11. We have to fight the left-wing McCarthyism of our alma maters, of our children's schools, everywhere. We have all to get up involved. We have to create a new syllabus to deprogram young people who have been brainwashed in our universities to believe that America is evil, that Israel is evil, that there is any merit to socialism over capitalism. I am well aware that Heritage has been fighting this fight for over 50 years. But we have to be honest. We are losing. We have to fight harder. The good news, we are not outnumbered. The radical left does not have more people behind them. They are just louder. We live, in a, we live in Washington or New York or California. You might think that we are a minority, but we forget there is a great, big, wonderful country out there with hardworking people, honest people, who are generous and good, but they don't like to get shoved around. And they so, certainly don't like to be told what to think, especially when it's nonsense. Let's always remember what Ronald Reagan said about the city on the hill. That shining city still there. It never went away. And it's still worth fighting for. The battle is as important as any other great nation has ever fought. Let's fight it together for the sake of our children and grandchildren, for the sake of the entire world. It's a battle we can't afford to lose. My topic has been Israel at 75, but it's also about America at 247. We will all have to work very hard to make sure both countries flourish for many, many more years to come. Together, I know we will do this. May God bless the United States. May God bless Israel. And God bless all of you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.